Hello everyone and welcome again to Salon Light TV. Thank you so much for joining me, your girl, Miss B, the teacher here live as we come to you from my apartment with a view of outside. <laughs> um, I wanted to make this video as a celebration of Black beauty inventors and contributors to the beauty industry not just the black beauty industry. Black beauty is a big enough industry all of its own, and we're talking about our product, services, technique, tools that are specifically geared for us and by us. But these inventors and contributors uh, have been and historically have been undervalued and just not recognized um, for contributions that we use across the beauty industry as we know it today. So I wanted to make sure that I was able to get this out before the end of Black History Month, doing as much research as I possibly could to make sure that when I put the links in the bio, I'm going to give you guys the um, uh, as much of a direct source as where I get my information from. Alrighty, so I wanted to be able to start out with not necessarily disputing anything that's already been out there with regards to Black inventors, uh, contributors in the industry. Um, so as a cosmetologist, and again, let me put the disclaimer out there. Thank you again for joining me, Salon Life TV. You can find me, Miss B, the teacher, on Instagram and Twitter. Miss B, T-H-A, the teacher, Instagram and Twitter. Also go to our YouTube page for Salon Life TV. And thank you again for joining me here on YouTube. So I have been a professional instructor for 15 or so odd years. Licensed as an instructor in Tennessee, Alabama, and Washington State. I've been a licensed practicing cosmetologist for almost 30 years. In that time frame, there are several known books with Milady's Pivot Point, several articles that have been out there about a few select contributors and inventors and what they gave to the beauty industry. And if you only leave it to one or two sources, you're going to think that's all the information that you have. So with that being said, um, Black America not having the control of most mass media, including media publications over the years, that trickles down to our books and things that we use in a cosmetology and barber school. So I don't knock um, the legacies of any people that we're going to mention, but the ones that have been left out, it's enough disrespect and it's time out for the disrespect. We have to give everybody their due. There's always been enough seats at the table. There's enough money for us to be made. And those that are um, responsible for making the dents in the industry that we know it, we've got to start giving people their respect. With that being said, Madam C.J. Walker has been in any cosmetology or barbering book for however many years. Milady is one that's been a publisher that's been out close to 100 years. Um, and most recently of about... 1960s or 70s or so, you started to see African Americans take prominence in certain sections of certain books. Um, I can give a shout out right now to Tony Love. She is still the one and only publisher that I know that has had a book published, I believe it was through my ladies at one point, on wigs and weaves and tutorials for different braids. Uh, shout out to Tony Love. She's a fellow Alabama girl. Right now, Tony Love International, if you want all of your info on, on how to become, and again, this video going out to the licensed, licensed, licensed professional. If you want to become a uh, certified hair loss specialist and be able to make that big five and $10,000 check, go to Tony Love International, take her classes, the lady is on point. She's doing what she needs to do. And I believe she has a, a program that she's working right now through one of the national cancer uh, organizations. And it may be American Cancer Society, where she's teaching you not just the uh, installation of the non-surgical hair pieces, but also how you can tap into the medical billing industry for those that are suffering hair loss. And you, as a professional in your salon, are going to be able to restore that for them. So, Tony has had a book that's been out for years, and I've loved it for years. I've always used it when I'm teaching specific courses in a cosmetology and barbering book. So, she is probably one of the foremost um, educators that are out there doing their thing today. You can find her at any professional hair show, Bronner, IBS, uh, ABS. Uh, I believe she actually does the Natural Beauty Culturalist Society. Um, that was at one point was uh, up under Madam C.J. Walker's purview, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so she's all over the place, and I believe her center is actually located in Atlanta. 
With that being said, that's just one instance of someone who's been included in the fold, so to speak, uh, with regards to giving appropriate um, credit to the person who is creating their own lane. Kim Kimball is enough that I've seen her with an article, I believe in a forward with one of the 2016, I believe, publications of my lady's cosmetology textbook. Glad to see that. She's done a lot in the, in the lane of teaching us how you can get out there and you could become that celebrity stylist. So let me make this clear right now. There is no professional license out there that has celebrity anything on. You gain the tagline or the hashtag as a celebrity stylist if you are one, a licensed professional. I always have to put these out there knowing that people, the average client still does not know what these look like. This is the state of Washington and wrangling with them for the better part of a month, I actually had to get two issues here. One, to designate me as an operator, that's the first one here, and the second one as an operator instructor. Your professional licenses will always have the name of the state, designated them being that particular licensing or regulatory board. So, Board of Cosmetology and Barbering can be a co-joined board or it can be separate entities. But there's only going to be one of the two. Under cosmetology and barbering, if it's co-joined, everything is there together. But specifically, cosmetology will also make sure that you're going to uh, deal with aesthetic and nail care. Massage therapy is a separate board. Anyone doing microblading or anything with permanent cosmetics is a separate board as well with your local health department that typically regulates um, uh, anything with invasive, semi-invasive semi procedures. But specifically tattoo artists, is what regulates microblading. So cosmetology is what's here. This both is Washington State. This is Alabama here, current uh, state of Alabama here. You, all of your licenses are always going to have the state seal. Your license number is going to be indicated somewhere, and it's going to indicate exactly what your field is. And this is Florida. Florida is one of uh, licenses are saying that they're putting a QR code on it so when you come in and scan it it actually opens up your account for that state and gives a reading on wherever you are with regulations, fines, fees, anything along with that. License number here and again designating what your license has. So there's no state out of 50 states including two territories, Puerto Rico or Guam that issues a license called Celebrity Anything. You are a professionally licensed cosmetologist or barber, managing, master, journeyman, so forth, instructor, so forth, operator, so forth, and so on. License or either a permit. It'll be one of those two. Kim Kimball, though, getting back to that, she has been out there doing her work. She's had a show, L.A. Hair, out that's been out for a while. And so what she does, her legacy is she's taught people how to go out and gain celebrity clients. So she's been out uh, and doing one of the things that's a bucket list for me personally to go out and get work on video shoots, movie sets, television production crews, and of course photo shoots. And you're using celebrity and you're being requested by celebrities because of your reputation and your brand to come out and bring the best that you got. That's what being a celebrity stylist is. So kudos to Kim Kimball for that. Um, Kim Kimball also um, has her own hair brand, and that hair brand has been in semi-luxury stores like Ulta and Sephora for years now. Carol's daughter, I'll give credit to her, I believe Mary J. Blige and Jada Pinkett Smith were two of her early investors in her product line, and to me, she was one of the first black women to introduce a professional, uh, professional but consumer use, OTC, we'll call it an over-the-counter brand. Um, to consumers on a large wide scale and I believe it was HSN or QVC one of the sh home shopping network brands. She was one of the very first black business owners that I saw that had a brand for the black consumer. So kudos to her for that. So those are just some of our more recent contributors that I wanted to speak on but I wanted to make sure that this being Black History Month that we spoke on the black history and where all of us come from, where all of us has knowingly or unknowingly, conscious or unconsciously, where we have received inspiration from, all right? With that being said, uh, I came across a great article, and this is on Bustle.com, and Bustle is basically talking about articles of inventors and contributors to the industry, so I actually wanted to 
add more to what I knew was in my personal bag uh, as far as what I've been using in addition to known publications that are out there. And I literally had, I get so much joy and value out of seeing a student's eyes light up and they get it and I didn't know that. And oh, really? That's the whole process of learning for me. So you've got to understand that if you're a critical thinker and you're a logical thinker, it's not good enough, just enough for me to read any one thing. I'm going to want to dig and dig and dig. So loving the invention of everything with social media and everything that's a click away right now, there really is no excuse for anyone's unconscious awareness anymore. So this video is just as important for any student watching, any instructor, any other professional person that's already out there. These are the things that you really and truly want to make sure that you're able to still contribute and have fun with once you're going to be um, putting together your livelihood for yourself. Once you're in your business, because clients really do truly appreciate, and I've just been blessed over the years, when I've been in a salon working uh, full time, to have clients that understood my personal grind and affinity for knowledge. You know, trying to get my phone situated here so I don't lose the speed. Okay, there we go. Alrighty, so with this being said, um, let's go to the page of Bustle.com. And the article says it's African-American female inventors who created the beauty products that we love. So specifically, let's get started on where they are. One is, I thought was a great idea, anyone who's ever had a paddle brush or a cushion brush, um, it's just basically a synthetic hairbrush. Most original hairbrushes, and if I'm not mistaken, we can go back to um, Roman and Greek uh, African mythology times, back when people were actually using, when we were founding some of the most earliest artifacts of what people were doing for personal grooming. So using things like horse hair, um, uh, raccoon hair, uh, a lot of hair that was uh, your natural boar bristles from the boar, the, the actual um, wild animal, the wild boar, um, and attaching them in an instance where you can use it to separate strands and detangle the hair that's been out there for years. But to give people an option on what they wanted to use, the synthetic hairbrush was in, uh, created by Lyda Newman. And this article states that variations of hairbrushes have definitely been around for a while, but the synthetic bristle hairbrush we still use today was created by none other than women's rights activist Lyda Newman. When she wasn't working in her own hair salon, she was serving as an important part of the women's suffragist movement in early 1900s. So, Lyda Newman, kudos to you, and thank you so much for your invention here. Again, take any of these names that I'm dropping, guys. Do a little bit more research. Go and Google them and find out who these people are for yourself. All right, our next person that I wanted to mention, it's a, a beauty product, not a beauty salon product, but it's definitely a product that many women today can give credit to. This was Mary Kenner. She was the inventor of the sanitary belt or the sanitary maxi pad as we know it today. Thank goodness for Miss Kenner for changing the game of women's hygiene with her invention of the sanitary belt in 1956. Otherwise known as the great grandmother of the maxi pad. Though they weren't the most comfortable things in the world to wear and definitely didn't have wings in their invention, without this invention we wouldn't be sitting pretty now. Let's not forget that Mary also invented the tissue paper holders that are in every grandmother's bathroom across the world. And I don't know about tissue paper holders being in somebody's grandma's house. I got a couple right now, every bathroom. So the actual holder, either the metal one or the, the wooden one that you slide your toilet paper on for convenience, that's the tissue paper holder. So Mary Kenner was also the inventor of that. Um, so go and uh, Google Miss Mary Kenner and give her a round of applause. We thank you very much. 
I wanted to then follow up with two things that I wanted to drop these ladies names because um, what was invented and their contribute to these inventions is what's now that can be debated. So I'm going to go ahead and jump on this article that also mentions Madam C.J. Walker. Madam C.J. Walker has been credited with um, revolutionizing the hair relaxer method. So according to Bustle.com, Madam C.J. Walker is truly the pioneer for women's beauty. She created several different beauty products under her brand, the most famous one being modernizing of the women's relaxer. So she was not the creator of the relaxer, she was a modernizer. Though it is still not the method used today particularly, her method of relaxing women's curly hair patterns was a lot less harmful than applying the live soap that was typically used directly on the scalp to shampoo the hair. And what people realized, leaving some of the residue in the hair, parts of the hair came out straighter. That was where the use of live in kind of did a, a multiple use. So with that being said, we will give Madam C.J. Walker credit for her inventions. I'm going to take it back a step further because any teacher has always had a great teacher. Madam C.J. Walker's teacher herself was a woman by the name of Annie Malone. So we're going to go to Annie Malone here on Wikipedia. Um, I've heard her name in some of my older um, mentors myself mention. And so Annie Malone was the teacher of Madam C.J. Walker. Annie Minerva Turnbull Malone was an African-American businesswoman, inventor, and philanthropist. She was one of the first African-American women to become a millionaire in the first three decades of the 21st century. She founded and developed a large and prominent commercial, commercial and educational enterprise centered um, on beauty products and inventions specifically for African-American women. Okay, so Annie Turnbow's career, let's talk about that quickly. Um, she actually, and this is where the debate comes in at, was Annie Malone an agent for Madam C.J. Walker or was Madam C.J. Walker an agent of Annie Malone? So from... The fact that Madam C.J. Walker and her descendants have created a legacy, she has become the foremost prominent face of the first black woman African-American millionaire. So the debate is whether or not it was her or actually Annie Malone, and you can look at the timeline. So Annie Malone actually outlived Madam C.J. Walker. Let's put that out there. However, certain things in their histories were parallel to each other. Annie Malone was did uh, develop her own beauty school. She developed her own beauty products and she was able to get out there and create a national sales force to sell those beauty products. Very similar to what Madam C.J. Walker did. So truth be told, and, and the word is that Annie Malone created her own product. Madam C.J. Walker being one of her agents and took up residence in the Denver, Colorado area. And this is kind of where after Madam C.J. Walker coming from the south and being um, descendants of ex-slaves and how she began her ascent into the black beauty industry. So her career bio picks up with the story of her starting out in the Denver, Colorado area. How did she get there is the question. So by her being supposedly an agent of Annie Malone and she started her products in that area. Annie Malone's products actually uh, started out uh, in and around uh, when she opened up her first shop in 1902. And Madam C.J. Walker uh, operated out of um, Denver, Colorado again. And Annie Malone, I believe, was operating in and around St. Louis, Missouri. So kind of with them separating and being across country for one another, what I heard what happened with the fallout between these two women, and again, this shows us where we can get up and there's room at the table for all of us, but we've got to now know that there's enough room for us to create our own legacies without us fighting and butting heads against one another. So Madam C.J. Walker supposedly basically took some of the same ideas that Annie Malone had, and she went and started her own hair care brand, started her own agent, started her own school, and started her own business. 
So we're not going to say that anyone ripped each other off or stabbed one another in the back. But, you know, we see enough of that today in 2019. So quite naturally, some of that had to be going on during the time of these places. However, I think the Madam C.J. Walker leg legacy has been well preserved over the years. And I actually think the hair product is making a resurgence. And I do believe that the product is going to show up in um, whoever is managing uh, the brand. Um, right now, you're talking about uh, brands that are being managed like hedge funds, basically. So you've got a huge legacy there. And people know what the black hair care market is all about. It's about the dollars. We spend, spend plenty of money on these wigs face, beats, hair, makeup, everything else. So that Madam C.J. Walker uh, brand is ha uh, having a resurgence with the success of companies like Miss Jessie's, Mixed Chicks, again, Carol's Daughter, um, companies like that that have been out for a while. And I believe that brand, I saw articles, if I can find the link in the bio, I'll put it in. I believe it is being um, redistributed through Sephora, uh, or maybe Ulta, something like that, but it has kind of a medium tier, upper tier type of a master uh, distributor as far as an over-the-counter brand that it's starting to see that resurgence. And they are solely banking on the history of that. The Madam C.J. Walker Mansion was uh, recently bought by um, a VC, a venture capitalist, who plans on turning the legacy of that mansion, which was owned privately by another black couple for like the t past 20-something odd years. And I, at one point, thought that it was going to be turned into a museum, and I think that they're actually working on cultivating it into an actual business and educational center for black beauty business owners, culturalists, cosmetologists, barbers, what have you. So it's going to be turned back into what it was initially designed to be, which was to be a haven and something to show you what black excellence is all about. So Madam C.J. Walker's legacy is developing a big resurgence here in these years of 2019, and kudos for that. All right, also on the Bustle article, I wanted to make sure that I did not leave out a mention to Marjorie Joyner. Marjorie Joyner was a contributor and a redeveloper. Uh, she redesigned to her method the permanent wave machine. So this is not to throw out what was actually developed by the Charles Nestlers of her day. And, and uh, he can, again, go and look at any cosmetology, beauty, barber, book, or whatever, and you're going to find that history. Uh, Marjorie Joyner herself. Um, actually was able to um, invent or create a different version of the permanent wave machine. So according to Bustle here, it says that though uh, Nestler is the actual inventor of the hair perm permanent wave machine, um, Marjorie Joyner's wave making machine was used throughout salons to create the same effect without the chemical processing. Plus, she came up with the invention of using pot roast cooking pans and supplies circa 1939. So that's kind of a way that you would wrap the hair around these pans and you would apply a heat method to create the kinky and the curly look for the permanent wave machine. And that was Miss Marjorie Joyner. You can also find her on a, her Wikipedia page. And with regards to the permanent wave design, uh, it has a great photo here of the actual patent. So we're going to say that Marjorie Joyner was one of the very early 20th century black women to receive a patent by the U.S. Patent Office. Not the only one, but her patent design is mentioned as U.S. Patent Number 1. Million six hundred ninety-three five hundred and fifteen. All right. So here, and it was uh, patented originally around 1905. Of course, uh, Charles Nestler did his invention early in England in the late 19th century. Um, patented in London around 1909, and again in the United States in 1925. Miss Joyner's invention in 1939. She started looking for an easier way for women to curl their hair, taking an inspiration from pot roast cooking pans with paper pans to quicken the preparation time. 
Ms. Shauna experimented initially with these paper rods and soon designed a table that can be used to curl or straighten hair by wrapping it. This method allows hair stylists, uh, hair styles that stylists uh, invented to last for several days. At the beginning of her invention, however, there were complaints from the users that it was a bit uncomfortable. That is when Miss Marjorie improved it with the simple idea of having a scalp protector used while the client was having her hair curled. Again, that patent design, if she was patented, is still standing, still on record today. Patent number 1,693,515, establishing her as the first African-American woman to receive a patent specifically for hair design elements. The first African-American woman, period, to receive a, a patent was actually Miss Sarah Good. She was an entrepreneur and an inventor. And she invented what they call the fold the fold away bed as we know it. So people that were living in very tight spaces, you had a bed that was able to come down out of the wall or a cubby hole, fold in or fold out and be able to uh, sleep in that unit and that was her initial. So giving her credit to be the first person for a U.S. patent, Sarah Good, Marjorie Joyner being the first African-American woman to receive a patent specifically for a beauty invention. So with that being said, I wanted to make sure that the last thing, giving all of these kudos to the black women, and I love it, I wanted to make sure that it was not just going to be a video about just black women, but I've got, I'm a black woman, got to give credit where credit is due. So touching back bases again uh, on the article with Bustle.com with Madam C.J. Walker, she improved the method of using relaxers that we know today, sodium hydroxide, which is uh, a lie, very caustic, high pH chemical. Lye itself has been in soap for numerous, numerous, numerous years. A lot of really caustic, corrosive, harsh elements have been out there for use by people for years until we, of course, find out that they're not so great. Carcinogens, for instance, anything that's cancer-causing, has been floating around in air, water, different things for a lot of years until we realize that this is, causes problems with human hair, skin, or nails, and we need to try to use something else. So we're always coming across things either by in mistakes, and I don't like to say a mistake has been made versus what was the discovery in that mistake. You weren't going down, you were going down this road looking for this way out and that way out, but you happen to find another way out just by trying something or doing something different, however intentional or unintentional it was. So going back to the, um, the improvement of the hair relaxers by Madam C.J. Walker, the chemical lie itself was actually uh, engineered and discovered by a black man by the name of Garrett Morgan. Garrett Morgan was a black inventor, not specifically anything making a foray into black beauty products until he discovered the chemical lye, as we know it today by its chemical name, sodium hydroxide, which is still the main ingredient in most uh, chemical, all chemical relaxers today, unless you're using a no lye chemical relaxer base, which will then take you to potassium, lithium, calcium, several other hydroxide bases. But hydroxide in and of itself is still a lie, and pure lie is sodium hydroxide. Garrett Morgan previously uh, invented the smoke hood that many firefighters use today. So the precursor of the smoke hood or the actual ventilator was uh, invented by Garrett Morgan. Garrett Morgan also made an improvement, did not actually invent the original traffic signal, but made an improvement on the original traffic signal, which was actually, I think, created in the UK early on. And the first American-made automobiles were introduced to, con um, to consumers at the turn of the century, and we needed to make a way to make sure that you can get traffic under control. So Garrett Morgan was actually the person who entered um, the warning or the yellow yield sign on the traffic signal. Before, there was just a red and a green sign, a stop and a go. Morgan uh, witnessed several accidents at several intersections during his time, and he filed a patent for a traffic control device adding a third warning position in 1922. 
um, Morgan sold the rights, that partic particular license right, to the General Electric or GE company that's still around today for about $40,000. So again, when you're having black people that create lots of things, and during those times we're thinking about making a good profit, we're going to sell something, we're going to get something, and we're going to get the check, that's all great. But you got to understand that the name of your legacy is what stands the test of time. So if GE had the ability to sign this man $40,000 back during the turn of the century, very few people know who Garrett Morgan was. I kind of take this as there's a movement that's going around now about the slave who actually gave, um, oh gosh, what's the liquor brand? Um, Jack Daniels, the recipe for his very well-known still today Jack Daniels whiskey recipe. It wasn't by the creator of the son of Jack Daniels. It was a slave. Um, who was either owned by the Daniels family or was a neighbor on, on a neighboring plantation. So this is one of those instances here where we create, we have ideas, we have been intuitive, intellectual, um, inclined for our history as kings and queens of this earth. And we have to make sure that people understand. Thank you so much for signing in. We have to make sure that people understand that who we are and what we contribute is what makes us who we are. I mean, we are the original kings and queens of the earth, not giving or taking anything away from anyone else. But we've got to know to un and learn our legacy. We've got to know better in order to do better. Okay, so with that being said, Garrett Morgan actually was looking for a better way to in um, create a coating for sewing machine needles. So the needles were moving at such a rapid pace that once they pierced the fabric to drive in the thread, it actually would burn the fabric. So he was looking for a way to coat the needles so that you could get the production out of your sewing machine without destroying the fabric. And during this particular process, he noted the coating of the machines was allowing the fabric to lay, like wool fabrics and things, I believe is, is the, the history of it to lay smoother and straighter. With that being said, through his concoction and through his ability as an inventor and an engineer, he actually created the substance that we know today that holds true in those that are using chemical hair relaxers, lye, soap, uh, any of your hair removal products, neat, nair, surface products, they remove hair at the surface. All of that has lie in its chemical makeup. Turn the product bottles around and start reading the ingredients. You'll see things that are in a descending order by order of what's most present down to what's least. So sodium hydroxide, lye, the base ingredient in hair relaxers is actually uh, credited to Garrett Morgan. With the recognition of that, then yes, Garrett Morgan himself then took a foray into hair care products. Uh, his Wikipedia page says that Morgan experimented with the liquid that gave sewing machine needles a high polish that prevented the needle from scorching or burning the fabric as it sewed. In 1905, Garrett Morgan accidentally discovered that the liquid could also be used to straighten hair. He made the liquid into a cream and launched G.A. Morgan Hair Refining Company in order to market it. He also made a black hair oil dye and invented a curved tooth comb to help straighten the hair in 1910. So with these historical figures that I've just mentioned, our newer figures that I've mentioned with regards to Tony Love, Carol's daughter, um, Kim Kimball, guys, we as black people have historically contributed a lot to the world society, and there's no stopping it anytime soon. We've got to understand that your legacy it's what you do right now. It's who you are right now. In regards to where I am, where I'm teaching, what salon that I'm in, um, I just got off with a, a client on yesterday consulting him on buying a, a multi-unit 
franchise school in California. Um, I don't, you don't get to just create legacies and build legacies overnight. You've got to be dedicated to your craft and to your art. As an educator, this is why I found it from online TV. Um, we've got to know our history and love our history. There's not enough of what we do, with, first of all, without having to just put ourselves out there as being black people. And hopefully, eventually, I hope that we can start to give that respect to one another without just focusing on being black. Because I wanted this video particularly to not just be about the things with regard to black hair products or black skincare products, but just to let people know that several products that we use today are just about black inventors, period. Uh, I'll put a separate link in the bio there that you guys can go and you can look and find a black inventors list. And you've got inventors there that, my goodness, that they have invented all kinds of everything. I'm going to see if I can pull uh, something up right now just to give a quick rundown on a list of people that and their inventions specifically in the industry um you know several different things that are out there um carter g woodson and different things that are in all kinds of things for black history but we've got several things that people need to know what was actually developed um we have people that are great mathematicians civil engineers ophthalmologists um chemists different things that are out there that black people have invented and not given enough credit or the credit that they should deserve. So what I have done is put in, hopefully you guys will be able to see it in the uh, JPEG for the video, one of the photo links that I wanted to use so you guys can know what's out there. Um, again, the almanac was invented by uh, Benjamin Banneker. Um, the clothes dryer that we know was invented by uh, George Sampson in 1971. Um, the almanac was Benjamin Banneker in 1791. The baby buggy, you know, the precursor to the stroller that we know right now for all of our kids. William Richardson in 1889, uh, a curtain rod, you know, uh, introduced to the world by Samuel rotten in 1892. Um, the iron and board uh, introduced to us by Miss Sarah Boone in 1887. Uh, a folding bed by Leonard Bailey 1899. A fountain pen, your standard pen that we're writing with now, fountain tip pens by Walter Purvis in 1890. What else have we got here? The rolling pen that anyone who's a baker, and I'm a halfway decent baker, Introduced by John Reed in 1864. Um, the Tricycle by Matthew Cherry in 1886. So those are just to name a few of the inventions that we know by and large. Not necessarily black beauty, but black inventors. Um, and we are making an impact and a dent on the world from over 100 to 200 years ago. I can only see with all of the education that we have at our fingertips now the exposure that we have and the platforms that we have, what type of impact that we can have going forward. So with that, guys, I wanted to make sure that I was able to let you all know that what we do know and love today, it's still relevant. One of the last things I wanted to make sure that I was able to um, make a good impact on and make sure that... Um, People knew what this thing called black hair care is all about. Right now, I'm wearing a piece by uh, Diva Trask, and I'll have to go and um, uh, get the actual brand for you guys. But let's go back to the person who actually created the sew-in method as we know today. A woman by the name of Christina Jenkins. Christina Jenkins wigs, pieces, and wigs for what? Have been around again since, you know, your Cleopatra days. However, the pieces that we know today was actually patented by a black woman that's a sew-in hair 
track sew in method. This is a full lace wig that I've used. The wigs have been around for a long time. But the inventor of the sew in method on the weave that we know that is a 50 billion or more dollar business as we know it right now uh, was actually invented by Christina Jenkins, a black woman. Not only just invented, but patented. Okay? Christina Jenkins is credited with inventing the sew-in hair weave technique. The process of adding hair in hair extensions was centuries old. However, Jenkins improved on these techniques by creating a process of sewing in hair extensions rather than simply pinning them to the scalp. While employed as a wig maker in 1949, Jenkins became aware that customers often complained that their wigs would fall off their heads frequently, causing embarrassment. She began to explore ways to rectify the concerns. She obtained a patent in 1951 for her process, where her technique was extremely popular with clients and cosmetologists alike, and Jenkins traveled across the world sharing her technique. Jenkins opened up the Hair Weave Academy to train licensed cosmetologists, and people came from all over the country to be trained in her method and her technique. Um, the sale of her hair extensions is currently, the sale of hair extensions in general, is currently a multi-billion dollar industry, and there are many different hair weaving techniques today, all thanks to Christina Jenkins who unfortunately left us and died in 2003. And I'm going to try to make sure that I get a link to the best article possible to make sure that we get uh, the actual link mentioning her patented number because i like to make sure that I can get, again, um, the best degree of information to you guys. Again, her patent number was submitted uh, and approved. Um, okay, I'm here seeing December 16th. 1952, and here we go. The U.S. patent number was 2621663. U.S. patent 2,621,663. So U.S. patent 2621663. Kudos again to you, Miss Christina Jenkins. You changed the game. Um, We've got to make sure that it's not just enough for us to create things. And we've got to envision our history like the Rockefellers, uh, the Rothschilds, who are still, you know, dominant presidents in the everyday um, the banking industries as we know it today. Um, all of your politicians, I could say they kind of get it. Um, they establish their names in whatever way that they're going to come up, but they establish museums, they establish businesses. Uh, the Clintons, for one. Bill Clinton was uh, an ambassador for one of the largest online uh, for-profit companies, receiving just like $17 million a year to show up, like literally, maybe a total of 8 to 10 hours out of the year to just give commencement speeches at several properties with, with uh, school uh, colleges on properties such as like Phoenix uh, University and places like that just because it was Bill Clinton. Um, they've got museums, they've got stakes at other companies, oil companies, things of that nature. So people, when we make our money as black people, it's great for us to get out there and make good money and, and build what we know now and substantiate our um, legacies as we're doing right now, but we've got to make sure that we're doing as much as we possibly can to make sure that we're going to be respected uh, long years down the road. Um, and our name, our word is our bond. So if we're making money, that's great. we got to make sure that we're, making, we're keeping those legacies intact, guys. And it's not just enough to just have an article out there for you. And that's great to, to have your name mentioned and you're up in bright lights. What is your legacy? What is the next generation and the generations after you going to learn from you, about you, through you, what it is that you contributed today? For me, 
I could care less about popularity. If that popularity is not making a difference and it doesn't serve a purpose and in the realm of business, if it doesn't turn a profit, I could give a shit about being popular. You know, we've got to make sure that we separate our emotional needs from everybody knows who we are and I got a ton of friends. That's great. But can you turn a profit on that? Um, are all your friends able to support you? Not just, oh, girl, I like what you do. Support means you're going to show up and you're going to spend money with my business. And that is a great lesson that I learned throughout my years as a cosmetologist. You can like me as a person all day long, but business is business. So now in with this platform with Salon Life TV, uh, I try to use it as much as I can to educate and inspire those. And, and that's my particular purpose you know, in life, particularly now as an educator. So what I'm going to do is continue to serve that purpose. I'm going to get off here. It's time for me to log in. I got some uh, research to do. I got some papers to write because Miss B, the teacher, has got a PhD she's trying to earn. So thank you guys so much for tuning in again to this video. Check out my previous video. It was more of a rant than it was an education. Uh, you want to go and take a look on maybe what some black companies and industries are doing out here not so great to preserve a legacy and i won't even mention that name again because i just really don't want to give that much more energy to it but regardless check us out on salon life tv and youtube salon life tv that's my facebook group miss b the teacher instagram and twitter and thank you all again for tuning in watching leave your questions your comments check out the links in the bio Give me some suggestions or ideas on what you think you want to see or hear about next. I do think I'm probably going to drop something this week as a part two. Previously to the um, complicity video that I did for Surviving R. Kelly. Uh, this is going to come more now as some of the things since he's actually been charged and received the indictment. How does that affect us in the salon and spa industry? It affects us all day long because we're still talking about women that got videotapes from this guy from over 20 years old. Uh, grown women that have been involved with this man as recent as four or five years ago. And these women showing up at the courthouse, hair's done, hair's laid, it's this, that, and the other. So it's still affecting us because these women are out spending money through him in our beauty salons, our barber shops, buying our products. These women, um, um, whether they choose to be with him or not, they, they completely brainwashed or not. It affects us because, you know, we're enabling the, pro the problem by proxy. Um, we're accepting money by these women that are being trafficked and women that are being held against their will and women that are being forced into these type of situations with predators such as R. Kelly. So that's probably going to be my next video later on this week. Take a, uh, you know, be on the lookout for that. Anything else you think you guys want to comment about? Something funny, something this or that, something whatever? Drop a comment. Let me know. I appreciate you guys so much. I am Miss B signing off. And you guys be safe out there, please. Salon Life TV, Facebook, and YouTube. Miss B the teacher, Instagram.